right, so this is something that I wanted to share with you all today. Um, and I did mention this in a previous vlog, maybe it's day one or two, about uh, Vince Gironda and the burn study. So uh, this is the actual, I guess, summary or the study that was published. Uh, this is the article about it that was published in the British Journal of Plastic Surgery. This is from British Journal of Plastic Surgery, 1975. 35 eggs per day in the treatment of severe burns. So we talked about positive nitrogen balance before. At the very top, they're talking about positive nitrogen balance in order to maintain positive nitrogen balance in extensive burn victims. The daily calorie requirements may be as high as 7,000. Oral feeding is the pathway of choice. It is, however, often difficult for extensively burned patients to ingest large quantities of meat, fish, and other calorie-rich, nutrient-dense foods. So, over the past two decades, this particular group was feeding severely burned patients between 30 and 40 eggs per day, and they appeared to be readily assimilated, easily ingested, and did not have any side effects. All right, so if you look down here at the total daily intake from all sources, you see that just 35 eggs was able to give them almost 2,800 calories. And, you know, it was a lot of protein on a lot of fat. So, um, yeah, they were, they were able to achieve that with their 36, 35 eggs per day. Uh, what I thought else was interesting is if you look at the, this little section on serum protein, talks about the average initial level of total serum proteins was 4.1 grams per 100 mil, but rose to 6.25 grams per 100 mil by the 16th day and thereafter remained constant. Now, one of the reasons why eggs are so potent is because they are a complete protein and not just a complete protein. I mean, they have this optimal ratio of fat and protein. They also contain hormones. They contain cholesterol and all of that cholesterol, which is dietary cholesterol, which is completely fine. And you're going to see that referenced further in this study. That dietary cholesterol plus the hormones that are coming in those eggs, the sort of pre, well, I guess I would say the androgenic compounds that are already found in eggs, uh, between those two things, uh, it's extremely helpful. I mean, this is an egg. Everything contained in there has to create life. It has to create a life, and that life is going to be dependent on just the things that are contained in that egg. So everything for that life has to be in there. And that may not be significant when just eating one or two a day, but when you're eating 35 or 36 a day, then you're getting a massive dose of nutrition, of fat, like nutrients, right? Like vitamins and minerals. You're getting a massive dose of fat. You're getting, which, you know, some of that's cholesterol, which is hugely important for you to make your own hormones. Uh, you're also getting a lot of high quality protein. And in fact, egg protein, when you're eating the whole egg, is um, the high, has the highest utilization rate of any animal protein. It's like 48%, I think. So that's really high. Uh, typical protein, beef and chicken and pork, fish, things like that are all going to be around 30%. Interestingly, if you eat the egg whites alone, that's only going to be 17%. And the reason why it's such a poor utilization if you just eat the egg whites alone is because the egg whites um, don't have the complete amino acid profile. And that's why you have to eat the whole egg. You need a complete protein. You need that complete amino acid profile. And there's an optimal amino acid profile for creating everything that you know creating this life and that's what's in that egg so you need to eat the whole egg 
All right, and then uh, if you look at this little section here, down here on serum lipoproteins, all right, so they're gonna talk about cholesterol. It said the high egg diet certainly represents a significant dietary cholesterol load. An egg contains between 250 and 550 milligrams of cholesterol. And so their patients were imbibing, drinking, they were drinking this, over 7,000 milligrams of cholesterol per day. So that's seven grams of cholesterol. That's a lot. But contrary to expectations, serum cholesterol and lipoprotein levels remained normal throughout the period. That shows you right there, this has been long known, that dietary cholesterol doesn't actually impact your serum, your blood cholesterol levels. All right, those are two different things. The kind of cholesterol that you eat is utilized by your body, but your body um, is going to produce cholesterol based on your basically your energy intake, your dietary intake of saturated fats and other things and sugars, carbohydrates. And that's, you know, your liver controls the production of cholesterol. So if you have too little, too little, your liver will make more. If you have too much, your liver will make less. And that is tr tightly controlled because, you know, cholesterol and LDL and HDL, they all have a function. And so those are all tightly regulated by the body. Uh, the only time you gotta worry about LDL is really in a high carbohydrate, high, inflama high inflammatory diet, such as a standard American diet. This is a diet that's gonna be high in uh, inflammatory foods like refined grains that's going to be high in inflammatory and high oxidative stress inducing foods like refined carbohydrates and high insulinogenic foods like refined carbohydrates so when you put those together uh, that's when you have laid the foundation for cholesterol for LDL actually to be oxidized and glycated and that is when you run into problems if you're eating a diet where you're not eating refined grains and refined carbohydrates and you're getting things like seed oils out of your diet then you're on a very low inflammatory diet and as a result your diet is not very insulinogenic chronic insulin is also inflammatory so that's why you want to avoid that and um, high amounts of blood sugar and chronic insulin levels, um, aside from being inflammatory, they can also produce oxidative stress. And that oxidative stress can lead to oxidation of LDL. And you can also, if you have a lot of, uh, very, if you have very high blood sugar, you can get, in addition to inflammation, you can get glycation of the LDL, where literally basically like uh, carbohydrate or basically like blood sugar molecules kind of get stuck to the LDL. The LDL basically becomes, when it becomes glycated, it's almost like when you burn sugar or something and it gets real sticky, basically it turns to something like a caramel. So imagine caramel coated LDL. This is the best way I can describe it. Imagine caramel coated LDL. Now it's sticky, right? It's almost like it's got sugar all around it. And as a result of having this sticky, sugary, you know, mess around the LDL, that's when it starts wanting to stick to things. And when your blood vessels are inflamed, then there's more room for small LDL particles to, to fall into those cracks and crevices. And then you get atherosclerosis and all that so now you can see that you know the cholesterol by itself is not an issue and you know this is a study from 1975 this has been known for 50 years okay so let's go to the next thing all right now let's look at why the diet works and the math behind the diet so this is again, it's based on the 35 eggs per day and the treatment of severe burns from that paper in the British Journal of Plastic Surgery. Okay, so first is what is our goals, our muscle building goals, and how do we achieve this muscle building, right? 
First of all, as mentioned before, positive nitrogen balance. So this is an optimal state for muscle growth, and it signals that your muscles are sufficiently recovered, and that you're ready to, which you're ready to basically go again, right? You're ready to work them more, or they're ready for more use, right? Uh, amino acids are another critical part of muscle building, right? You need to obtain the ideal ratio of essential and non-essential amino acids to promote an anabolic environment. And when we talk about complete proteins, people get really hung up on the essential amino acids, right? And is O is a protein complete. It's complete if it has all nine essential amino acids. But most animal proteins actually have all 20, is there 20 or 21? They have basically the full set of amino acids. And so as a result, not only do you get the, the essential amino acids, you're getting the non-essential amino acids. You know, your body can produce non-essential amino acids, but if you don't have to, then your body can spend time doing other things if it's already getting all of the essential and non-essential amino acids it needs and it's getting them in the proper ratios for muscle building then you've already done all the work for your body just through diet which means that your body can focus on building muscle and muscle recovery right the third thing with muscle building is to follow the rules of animalism, all right? That means, one, you're eating complete proteins. Two, train for animalism. We'll find out what that means in a second. And three is rest for recovery. Okay, so why positive nitrogen balance? Why is this important? So again, it's the optimal state for muscle growth where your nitrogen intake is greater than your nitrogen output. Again, this is a signal to the body that you are sufficiently recovered from your last workout and that you're ready, right, for more. Okay, and the third one is the greater nitrogen balance, the faster your workout recoveries will go, right? This is the body's anabolic state. This means, anabolic state means you're growing, right? This is the process of building or growing muscles. Um, the opposite of anabolism is catabolism, and that's where you're actually breaking muscles down. All right, so why complete proteins? Eating a complete protein source like eggs, um, meat, and milk all of those ensures that we obtain uh, the correct ratio of essential and non-essential amino acids. And again, we mentioned that you need to have both the essential and non-essential. You're just doing the work for your body, right? If you could do the work for your body, it's like this. If you go and you gotta, if you gotta build all your furniture because you bought it from Ikea versus someone delivers a couch to your house and it's already all assembled, right? Obviously, there's labor involved. If you're putting together a couch or a chair, then you can't be doing other things. You have a finite amount of bandwidth. You only have so much time and so much energy. Well, your body's the same way. Your body only has so much time and so much energy, and it has to allocate where it spends you know, its resources. If you're already giving it everything it needs, it can spend its time and energy on other things like muscle building, right, and recovery. So protein is the key building nutrient for every body tissue, basically. And what people don't understand is that protein, most of your body is, is protein, aside from water. Protein is 15 to 20% of your body weight. And it is the second most abundant thing, item, in the body second only to water. Eating sufficient complete proteins is the best way to achieve anabolism, to achieve that anabolic environment for optimal muscle protein synthesis. All right, and what are the three rules of anabolism? So the three rules of anabolism then are really just 
what we've already talked about, all right? You have to understand that every individual is a little different. And so each individual is going to have a little bit different efficiency at muscle protein synthesis. And because of that, you want to give yourself the best leg up. The, you want to set yourself up with the best possible environment so that you can maximize what your body can achieve, whatever that is. Whatever your body's limits are, you want to be able to leverage everything you can. So first, increase the nitrogen balance by eating plenty of proteins. You want to be eating animal proteins that have the correct ratio of essential and non-essential proteins in them from animal sources that gives you the proper ratios now if you choose to do plant proteins i'm not going to say you can't do it it requires a lot more work it requires a lot more protein it's going to require a lot of specialized things like protein concentrates that you have to eat i'm not a big fan of those things which is one of the reasons why I actually like this 36 egg diet because it's essentially just cream and eggs. Now there are there is some protein powder in uh, the shake, but um, what I'm using right now is not even milk and egg protein powder. It is a collagen powder. So uh, I'm not completely opposed to these things, but I don't want to get an incomplete protein and then have to basically supplement, have to supplement with a protein concentrate. What I'm doing is getting my complete protein and then I'm giving plenty of extra, right? It's just lanyap sprinkled on top to make sure, hey, just in case that wasn't enough, I'm gonna throw a little salt, a little dusting of extra protein your way to flavor this and make it perfect, right? Chef's kiss. All right, so the second thing that you need to really optimize and create an anabolic environment for your body, in your body, is sufficient rest. Uh, people, we as a society, especially Americans, we don't rest enough, so Personally, what I do, and I know not everybody can do this, but I, you know, go to bed when I get tired, and sometimes that's late, and sometimes it's early. I mean, it might be nine o'clock on some days, and there's other days when I do go to bed later, like ten or ten thirty. Um, I also really should limit my exposure to devices more than I do, but um, when I was at limiting my exposure to devices. I definitely found that uh, it was easier to go to sleep earlier. So there is something to be said for limiting your exposure to those devices if you actually want to be able to get to sleep. If you simply turn them off, put them away, and just try reading a book, trust me, you'll probably get tired after about 30 minutes and go, hey, I think I'm going to go to bed now. So. Just a bedtime routine that you could try and see how that works for you. Now, if you know you're not getting enough sleep, then you really should be trying to shift your schedule so that you're putting your devices away earlier and you're, you're going to a room that is cooler, you're going to a room that is absolutely dark, and that you're going to a room that's quiet and comfortable where you can actually achieve sleep. So that means, again, like TVs can't be on, your devices can't be in your hand, you can't be scrolling through social media, things like that. The third thing outside of sleep, which is hugely important, uh, the third thing is training. And just simply strength training. It needs to be short and intense. So the idea, I think, that you need to do hours and hours in the gym, it, it's just... It's something that I don't want to do. It's something I don't want my clients honestly wasting their time doing and because I don't want to waste my time spending hours in the gym. In fact, I've done everything. My body is completely outside of the gym, right? I have a small gym upstairs in my house, but for the first, the first time I did this diet and for the first 
seven or eight months that I was on the carnivore diet, I was not even living in this house. I had no access to any of the equipment that I have here. So I, I simply did body weight exercises. And even that is enough to stimulate an anabolic response, right? And it's, it just has to be short and intense. Long sessions, if they're too long, they basically put your muscles in a catabolic state. You do too much and it tears the muscles down too much and it you, you just can't recover. You can't recover elegantly. So just keep that in mind. Finally, a uh, real quick calculation. I'm sure you've seen this before. I've talked about this before. This is the math behind why uh, 36 eggs. And if you can see, you can follow through with me here, an average person like me who weighs 145 pounds, that's 66 kilograms. So remember from the study, they were targeting two to three grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. I don't know if I showed that to you just now, but that was in the study. You can obviously go look up that study yourself. It's available pretty much anywhere on the internet. So if we need two to three grams of protein per one kilogram of body weight, and you weigh 66 kilograms, well then one large egg happens to be six grams of protein in and of itself. So you take the 66 kilograms, you divide it by the six grams of protein per egg, and you get 11 eggs that are needed to give you one gram of protein per one kilogram of body weight. So if you wanna get two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, you would do 22 eggs, and three grams, you would do 33 eggs. So that's why if you just do 12, 24, and 36, you're pretty much covered. All right, so that is this in a nutshell. That is the, uh, the discussion of the burn study, the discussion of 36 eggs, and why it works in your body, and even the math behind the diet. So I hope you found this informative and you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please like and subscribe outside of that. If you got any questions, then please ask them. Uh, I'm in the process of setting up a Patreon. So when I get that set up, I'll let you know. And um, if you do want to donate, uh, you can click on the PayPal uh, link that is down in the description and you can donate money to me so that I can continue to make videos like this. Um, like I said, I hope you enjoyed today's topic. Have a great day.